Okay, so we spent a bit of time figuring out how to uh, use odds and apply odds in situations as well as how to uh, look at our basic fundamentals of probability. <clears throat> we got used to uh, a complement as well as the probability of any given amount and different types of probability. Started looking at dice as an example of a probability tool. Now what we're going to look at for this particular section, the focal point is multiple events and this whole idea of independent versus dependent. Okay, independent means that the probability basically stays the same all the time. So when you roll a dice over and over again, independent means the probability each time is exactly the same. The probability of rolling a one is always one out of six, one out of six, one out of six. Okay, it doesn't mean it has to stay the same probability, but the probability of each an event is consistent. However, with dependent events, what happens is the probability depends on what's happened beforehand. Okay, so a probability that's dependent has sort of a, a new adjusted probability the second time around, and then the third time it's adjusted, and the fourth time it's adjusted. A very good example of this is drawing cards from a deck as a probability tool. Uh, because when you draw cards from a deck, uh, there's less cards in the deck, so the total amount of possibilities is going to be less. Plus, it depends on what the previous card was. If the previous card was, say, I don't know, if you want to find out the probability of drawing a, a two, and a 2 had already been dealt out, then the probability is different than if a 2 hadn't been dealt out because it was dependent. It depended on what happened beforehand. Okay, and that's really what this first page is all about. Okay, so here we talk about a coin is flipped. What is the probability of getting tails? If you flip the same coin 99 times, each time a head was displayed in the coin, what's the probability that the next toss will be tails? It's still one half. The probability each time stays the same. Those are examples of independent events. The occurrence of past events has no effect or influence on the occurrence of future events, or the probability stays the same. The product rule, okay, and again, this whole section is all about multiple events, so it's about and, okay? First event and second event and third event, and then viewing it as a whole, okay? So this is like flipping three coins and looking at the probability of three heads, okay? It's an and scenario. The or scenario we're going to worry about tomorrow. Today we're going to focus on the and. So today is about and. And you can see the big and situations that I have here uh, in the notes that I have. Okay, so the product rule for the probability of A and B happening, maybe heads and then tails, uh, is going to be P at A times P at B. Okay, the star means multiply. Okay, for P at A and B and C, which means A, B, and C happens. So maybe a win and then a loss and then a win or heads and then tails and then heads or a one and then a three and then a five when you're rolling dice. It's P at A times P at B times P at C. So a good example is roughly, if you know the genetics, then it's a 50-50 chance whether or not someone's gonna have a boy or a girl. So if there's a family of three kids, uh, the probability of those kids working out the way that they do is gonna be one half for the first child, one half for the second child, one half for the third child. So let's say they have, I don't know, uh, three boys. Okay, the probability of getting three boys is one half for the first boy, one half for the second boy, one half for the third boy, but we don't add them all up. What we do is we multiply them. So the probability of having a family with three boys is one half times one half times one half or one eighth. Fairly unlikely. And the more, of course, of one gender that you have all the way throughout, either A suggests that the probability isn't a half each way or it's just a certain unusual circumstance. Okay? Anyway. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about those multiple events in our next unit and then the unit after that when we talk about repeated trials. But for now, we're just going to talk about the basics of it. We compare that to something called a dependent event. In a dependent event, the probability changes. So there's a whole uh, part I want you to read in here that talks about when one event has influence on the probability of another. And that, of course, leans towards what we call dependent events. Okay, and you know, you, you stub your toe, the probability of you stubbing your toe again is either increased or decreased, depending on what it does to you. You get into a car accident, the probability of you getting in a car accident again is going to change because you'll drive differently because you experienced a car accident. And that's the idea of the probability of future events or successive events after a particular event happens. As I said, it's best modeled with a deck of cards, and that's what we're going to use in this situation. So the product rule, same product rule for independent events, it's just P at A times P at B, or P at A times P at B times P at C. But product rule for dependent events is P at A times, and it's not P at B. So probability of A and B happening is you get the probability of A, which you know nothing else has happened before, so it really is what it is. But the probability of B isn't P at B. 
the probability of B is P at B with a slash A, which means the probability of B happening given, that's what this line is, given that A has occurred. Okay, so it depends on what A was. B's probability is now a new probability. This is like a new probability of B. Okay, anyway, A has influenced the effect or the probability of B. So let's look at some examples and there's some good illustrative ones that we're gonna look at in a second. So here, what's the probability of picking a king from a deck of cards? You should get to know a deck of cards because we're gonna use them a lot. Okay, so get used to it. They're a good probability tool and of course they're a good example of dependent events. What's the probability of picking a king from a deck of cards? Okay, well there's four kings in total, 52 cards. So the probability of a king is the number of ways in which you can get a king over the number of ways in total. This is only a single one event, okay? And so it's a four out of 52, reduced down to one out of 13. Nothing crazy, very straightforward. Let's look at the second one. Mr. Henley picks a king from a deck of cards and keeps the card out of the deck. The king is now gone. Let's say that, it's over here. Now, what is the probability of picking a king as the second card? Well, that probability is now changed. It's not one out of 13 or four out of 52 for two reasons. One, we only have 51 cards left in the deck. So now my denominator for my, or my NS is 51. There's only 51 things left to choose from. Okay, so the probability of a king would go up. But remember, I took a king out already, which means I don't have four kings left. I have three kings left. So now the number of successes that I could have or the number of kings that I could have is three. So it creates a probability that's conditional. It's dependent on what's happened beforehand. Okay, so the probability of king is not equal to the probability of a king after the first card drawn. So probability of a king given a king means the probability of me getting a king given that a king has already occurred. Okay, and of course it's three out of 51. Three because we have less kings and 51 because we have one less card. Okay, let's look at another scenario of repeated or multiple events. You are being dealt two cards. What's the probability of a king being dealt for the second card? Well, the probability of a king being dealt for the second card can't be answered because it depends on what happened in the first time. It could be a king followed, or it could be a, a, a king that's drawn after not a king, in which case we still have four kings left in the deck. So it's going to be a four out of a total of, remember, we've drawn a card out, so 51. But it could also be the probability of a king after a king has been drawn before. So the first card could either be a king or not a king. We did not a king, now we do a king. And that's what this is designed to show. So I've got the probability of a king comma king. Okay, that's getting a king first and a king second. And the probability of a king not prime, king prime, remember it's the complement of a king, and then a king. Okay, so this is the probability of a question mark, don't care what it is, and then a king. There's two situations. We could have a king and then a king. Now, the probability of a king is going to be the same for the first time, no matter what. Okay, it's going to be 4 out of 52, exactly what we would expect. But the probability here is going to be different. The probability of a king the second time, after having a king for the first time, the kings are going to drop down by 1, 3. The number of cards are going to drop down by 1, 51. And we get both of them together. We get a king and a king. Because we get a king and a king, we take the 4 out of 52 and the 3 out of 51 and we multiply them together. Okay, it's multiplied because it's... It's the first event and the second event, the first card and the second card. Now, for this situation, we also have to consider another possibility. We don't know what that first card is going to be. So the probability of a king, not a king, that's what this is, and then a king is the other situation that could happen. Now, because you could either have a king first or a king second, we add those two situations together. Okay, so this is the probability of a king and a king. This is the probability of not a king and a king, which is all the things that can happen given that my second card is going to be a king. So here's my probability of king primed or not a king, which is 48 out of 52. Why is it 48 out of 52? Well, there's four kings, which means there's 48 other cards in a deck of 52. So 48 out of 52. It's the first try, so we have 52 cards in the deck. But in the second try, okay, or in the second card that comes out, we know it's a king because we're looking for the probability of it. If we know that it's a king, there's four kings that are still left in the deck but there's one less card in the deck, the one that came out for this previous one. So when I look at not a king and a king, I multiply those two probabilities together. So this is situation number one, a king and a king. This is situation number two, not a king and a king. And it can either be this or this. So we see our two 
counting principles involved in here. The additive counting principle of this situation or this situation and the multiplicative counting principle because we have two different events that are happening and we're multiplying them together. What do we do to find the overall probability of the second card being a king? Again, we multiply these together. We will have a common denominator of 2,652. We add the 12 and the 192 and get 2,652. And strangely enough, it comes out to 1 out of 13. And there's a reason why it comes out to 1 out of 13, but we won't get into that necessarily. We'll come, over, uh, come more to that a little bit later on. Okay. Here's another situation. Now, this is the situation where we're playing Monopoly. If you've ever played the game Monopoly, we roll dice. Does the probability change each time when you roll the dice? No. So this is an example of independent events. Independent events means that the probabilities stay the same no matter what. Each trial it stays the same. We're not missing dice when they come out, right? We're not missing a face of the dice. It doesn't go anywhere. Whereas here we're missing cards. We're not missing anything here. So we're playing Monopoly and we're sent to jail. Now the way that it works for jail is the only way you can get out is to roll doubles. Okay, if you roll something else and you don't roll doubles, you don't get out, you miss your turn, and it goes on to the next group and it comes around to your turn and then you roll again. If you roll doubles, you get out. If you don't roll doubles, then you don't get out. Okay, so you keep on not rolling doubles until you get out when you roll doubles. So here's the situation. You fail to roll doubles in the first two rolls. What's the probability you'll roll doubles on the third roll? Well, if you take it Apart from this situation, the probability of your rolling doubles is just 6 out of 36. Remember, to roll doubles, it's a 1-1, one, one, a 2-2, two, two, a 3-3, three, three, a 4-4, four, four, a 5-5, five, five, and a 6-6. Six, six. 6 out of a total of 36. Okay, but in reality, for us to roll doubles on the third roll to get out of jail, we would have had to have been in jail for the other two rolls, which means we would have had to have been not successful, no doubles, not successful, no doubles, and then successful, doubles on the third. Otherwise, we can't roll doubles on the third roll to get out of jail if we're already out of jail. So we know what happened for the two first two previous. So this is what it is. It's D primed, not doubles, D primed, not doubles, and then D. And it's this and this and this. So we multiply them. I, I haven't put the multiplication signs between them, but they're scooched next to each other with brackets. So that's the same thing. So the probability of doubles on the third roll is contingent upon not having doubles for the two previous. Okay, so I have no doubles. Now, why is no doubles 30 out of 36? Remember, it's D primed. D and D primed should add up to 36 out of 36. We know that doubles is 30, 6 out of 36. So we know this is what's left over, 30 out of 36. And what you'll notice is each time the probability stays the same. Well, the probability of not doubles and not doubles stays the same. And the third time we do something different, we get doubles. And so, of course, the probability is going to be a little bit different. And so we multiply all those together because we get no doubles, no doubles, and doubles. Okay? No one to add to because that's exactly how the scenario had to work out. And you can reduce them and you end up getting 25 over 216. And of course, probably turning it into uh, a probability as a decimal. Most people do that because it's a little bit easier than reducing these fractions. It's also nice to do it that way because then what happens is you, um, you get used to that convention. The convention is we keep four decimal places for our probability. In B, what's the probability you won't roll doubles on any of the three rolls? Well, that's going to have to be... No doubles, no doubles, and no doubles. That's going to be 5 out of 6 or 30 out of 36. Okay? No doubles, no doubles, no doubles. And it's this and this and this. And as a result, we multiply them all together. We get 125 over 216. And it's a little bit above 50%. In fact, a little bit more than a little bit above 50%. Okay? And so that's the way in which we do probabilities of multiple events. So this is really the AND unit. Now we have some more examples. These examples are getting a little bit more complicated, okay, especially these ones. They're contingent upon different situations, but let's move on further. What's the probability of picking a heart for the first card and a club for the second card from a deck of cards? Well, the, we have to get hearts, and then we have to get clubs. But the probability of clubs is going to change because, of course, hearts has happened beforehand. So let's look at the probabilities. The probability of hearts is really easy. There's 13 hearts. There's 13 of each type of suit, so the probability of hearts is really easy. And then what has to happen after that is we have to get our clubs. But it's not just a normal probability of clubs, 13 out of 52, because we have one less card in the deck. Now, all 13 of the clubs are in the deck because we've only taken out a heart. So you've got 13 out of 52, the first event. And then we've got 13, 13 clubs, out of 52, sorry, out of 51 total. Again, this is the probability of clubs given that hearts has already occurred. Okay, normally this would be out of 52. If it was the first draw, but because it's the second draw, we have one less card, and so the probability has changed. 
Okay, because it's hearts and clubs, we multiply them together and we get this final result. Nothing too crazy, okay, but it does illustrate the idea. Okay, and of course you can look at different events happening in different scenarios. In this case, the forecast calls for an 80% chance of rain. The prob that's the forecast tomorrow. The probability that it will you the probability that you will remember your umbrella is 30%. Okay, so it's an 80% chance of rain. The probability of remembering your umbrella and having a good day is a 30% chance because then you get shielded from the rain. Okay, what's the probability that you will get wet? So the assumption is if you're gonna get wet, you didn't bring your umbrella. Okay, there's another option too. Or another consideration to keep in mind too is that it has to rain. It may not rain. If it doesn't rain and you forget your umbrella, no big deal. Okay, if it rains and you bring your umbrella, you're not going to get wet. But if it rains and you didn't bring your umbrella, that's when you get wet. So here it is. What has to happen are two probabilities that are mixed together. So the probability of you getting wet means the probability that it rains, 80%, and the probability of you bringing no umbrella. Now we're assuming that the probability of you bringing no umbrella stays the same. Of course, if you hear the forecast, you may be more or less likely to do it, but I'm a forgetful person. It's probably 30% all the time. So the probability of rain is 80%. The probability of you bring your umbrella is 30, but we want to not bring our umbrella. So it's going to be 1 minus 0 0.30, and as a result be 0 0.70. We multiply those two probabilities. It means that I have to, it has to rain and I have to forget my umbrella so that I get the probability of 0.56 of me getting wet. Those two events have to occur together. Finally, we got an example of Canadian snowshoe hares. Uh, they can sometimes have a slightly red coat. The probability that an animal has a red coat is 65%, and the probability of an animal with a normal coat is 35%. Those of you guys who've taken genetics know it should be a 25-75 or something like that if it's a heterozygous, homozygous, monoallelic, but it's multiallelic or something like that. The red coat helps the rabbit evade capture by most predators, increasing the probability of survival so that those with a red coat have an 85% probability, and those uh, of survival through a season, while those with a normal coat only have a 53% chance of survival. What's the probability that any rabbit survives? And the key is survival. So two things have to happen. You'll have to have a specific coat color and you'll have to not get caught by a predator. Okay, so we've got two things that are happening here, kind of like our rain and our umbrella. We've got a red coat situation and then the survival given the red coat. Okay, the red coat is 65% and the survival is 85% because it helps them maybe blend in with their environment. I don't know, there's a lot of red maples around or something, who knows, okay? Whereas the second situation could be, you could have a normal coat and then you could, of course, survive and not get caught by the predator just by luck or maybe you're, you know, you're only hunting at a certain time and you're more clever or who knows what it may be. In that case, of course, you've, the probability of a normal coat is 35% and that goes together with the probability of... Uh, surviving if you have a normal coat, and that's a conditional probability. So that's the situation there. Okay, so this is the probability of a red coat and the probability of survival given that there is a red coat. This is the probability of a normal coat and the probability of survival given that there's a normal coat. We're adding these because we could either have a red coat or a normal coat. And of course, we only care about red coat and survive and normal coat for survive if we're looking for survival. So those are two situations where they can work out. So keep those ideas in mind as you're going through those. Now to look at the math again, 65% for red coat, 85% survival. You multiply them together and you get this roughly 50% survival rate. The 35% normal coat times the 53%, you multiply those guys together because you have to have a normal coat and have survival. And as a result, you get about 20% there. Now you add these two situations together because you can either have the red coat and survive or the normal coat and survive. And of course that all narrows out to about 73-74% survival rate, which of course, you know, hopefully keeps the population, you know, at even or roughly stable in its steady state like it did in grade 9 ecology. Hopefully that works out well for you and you can get worked on, work on the homework assignment. Again, this is about multiple events. Write it out, spell it out, take your time. It should be pretty straightforward. Have fun with the questions.